Greetings beloved listener, and welcome to our program The Voice of Salvation, which aims to be a main source of inspiration for you through messages of hope and peace. This program is produced to be a blessing to you, and this is achieved when you stay tuned in. Stay with us and you will be blessed. And now, with you, the host of The Voice of Salvation, Nathan J. Bonilla. Hello and welcome to The Voice of Salvation. My name is Nathan Bonilla and I'm happy to have you with us here today. For the next few weeks, we will be talking about the church and we will be looking at a comprehensive examination of the church as depicted in the scriptures. We pray that our programming of the voice of salvation is a blessing to your life. I want to ask you to not to forget to share our programming with everyone and subscribe to our channels on YouTube and on Facebook. I do want to start by saying that those who possess a comprehensive biblical understanding of the church are regarded as blessed. They are blessed individuals for they're not constrained by the limitations of any particular era or civilization, but rather they comprehend the church's divine origin. That origin that was conceived in the mind of God before the creation of the world. The Old Testament prophets, these men were granted glimpses of its splendor. But not only that, but it was through fragmented visions. In contrast, the contemporary era today reveals an enhanced perspective of the church and its reality that is characterized by the unity of all nations and tongues bonded together by a covenant, a covenant that is unmatched in this world. You see, King Solomon poetically described the church as fair as the moon clear as the sun and terrible as an army with banners. He depicted this in the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10. He witnessed the church's purity and its power as a working force in the world. The prophet Daniel also received a vision of it, the vision of the church as a stone cut out of the mountain without human hands. Now, this vision of the church's destiny was not limited only to the Old Testament prophets, as many New Testament writers were also inspired with the vision of a remarkable community of believers united by a covenant. Though it had not yet reached its full maturity and development, the Apostle Paul perceived the church of God as the habitation of God. He expressed this in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22. The church of the living God, the pillar and ground, of the truth, as stated in 1 Timothy 3.15, a great mystery as described in the first chapter of Ephesians. And John the Revelator, well, John envisioned it as a bride adorned for her husband, according to the book of Revelation 21 and 2, while the Apostle Peter characterized it as a chosen generation. He described the church as a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That's found in 1 Peter 2, 9. Now, as we commence this 12-part study series of the church, as depicted in the Bible, it is our prayer that you will gain a comprehensive understanding of the church as God's divine program in the present era. We pray that our program of the voice of salvation will continue to be a source of spiritual enrichment in your life as you grow and you mature in Christ. In our first lesson, we will delve into the subject of the church and expound on Christ's role as his head. You see, it's essential to recognize that Christ remains the head of the church, owning his work as Savior and Lord. As the governing authority of his body, the church, he serves as the nervous system, for we can say, that shares his sensations of joy and grief and it coordinates its faculties, directs its movements, unifies its activities, and sustains the life of the church. The church being his one body is, in a sense, a part of his own personality, drawing life from, its, from him and sharing his experience and character and executing his will. Just as Christ is not a, 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 a monster in the sense of having many heads, so his church is not a monster in the sense of having many bodies as there is only one Christ himself, the head of the church. 
There is but one church, which is his one body. According to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, we find that also in the book of Colossians in chapter 2, Christ's headship over the church extends beyond it. And he is the supreme head of every authority and power, having put all enemies under his feet. The ultimate goal of God already accomplished through the cross and resurrection of Christ will be fully manifested when all things are subdued unto him and the son himself is subject to him who put all things under him. That God may all in all as stated in 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty eight. that God may be all in all. Now, according to the book of Ephesians, chapter four, verse 15, the Bible instructs us to speak the truth in love that we may grow into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, speaking the truth in love is a crucial aspect of Christian ministry and preaching and teaching. It involves not only being truthful, but also speaking the truth in a spirit of love. Truth is the very element in which we live, move and have our being. And it is the essence of Christian ministry. However, truth must always be presented in love. For truth spoken in harshness cannot be considered the whole truth, even if the idea conveyed is correct. Truth not spoken in love is often the result of truth that has not been experienced in the heart or lived in the life. Now, if we talk about truth in a systematic way, which is discharged, discharged mechanically from the mouth and mind, but does not stem from the life and spirit as such, is not the truth of God in its fullness. You see, when truth is presented in love, it results in growth in Christ. And this growth involves a closer union between the members of the body and the head of the body, Jesus Christ. Now, this closer union leads to development and greater knowledge of righteousness as we grow up into him in all things. In summary, speaking the truth in love is an indispensable part of Christian ministry as it leads to growth in Christ and a closer union between members of his body and the head of the body. Now let us turn our attention to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16 through 18. It states, For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth invisible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now this passage, along with others in the Bible, depicts Christ as the agent through whom all creation came into being. The relationship between creation and Christ is expressed as being in him, through him, and unto him. And he is eternal. He existed before anything else was created. And as we read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. You see, some of the Colossian teachers had elevated angels to a position almost on par with Christ. But the Apostle Paul corrects them by reminding them that even the highest invisible beings with their lofty names and mighty powers are still creations, just like the lowest objects we observe daily. Now, if we continue to read and we'll look at verse 17. We see that he is before all things and by him all things consist. This is the note that Paul keeps sounding in the ears of those who are prone to forget or to substitute other things in his place. You see, his headship over all things is akin to the expression, I am, found in the book of Exodus 3.14. And this is exactly the idea Paul wants to convey to his readers. It is in him that all things have their unity, and through him all things are consistent or constituted, in other words, into a whole. So apart from him, the world created and the things created lacks cohesion. But through him, all things are consolidated, have their being and have meaning. In verse 18, we see that he is the head of the body, the church. Who is what? Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Just as he is the creator, the sustainer, 
the authority and power of the universe, so he is the head of the church. The world of created things could not exist without him, nor would the church have any significance or reason for being today without him. As the body of Christ, the church is one with him in life, position, strength, and glory. In other words, he is the seed of her life, the source and purpose of her activity, and the center for unity in the power of her being. His headship is over the church and is having a result of having become the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. It is through Jesus Christ and through his death and resurrection that he has become the head of the church. He was not actually fully the head until that had been accomplished, just as he was not the creator of the universe until the creation was affected or accomplished or put into play from eternity. That doesn't take away from him and his power. Simply, it means that he was the son of God. And by right of divine inheritance, he was designated the Lord of creation when it was affected. Likewise, he became the head of the church after he had become the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead. And even though he had been designated to be its head from eternity, Christ, he is the triumphant head of the body of Christ. It's beautiful when we read in the Bible, in the book of Ephesians, chapter one, verse 21, we read that far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. You see, this passage declares that all classifications, all titles, all authorities in the spiritual realm are under the authority of Christ. The main idea of this passage is that people can reach their full potential only through Jesus Christ. He is the ruler of everything, and his name is supreme forever. No other name will ever be as great as his in this world or any other to come. You see, in verse 22, it asserts to us that all things have been placed under Christ's feet. He has been appointed as the head over all things for the church. This signifies to us the sovereignty as all things are subject to his power and control, and he has the absolute right to utilize them as he sees fit. This is comparable to a military commander in a crisis who has the authority to demand whatever is necessary to achieve his objection, objectives. So in other words, Christ's dominion over all creation is not merely an honor bestowed upon him, but a particular benefit to the church over which he presides as head. He who rules over all created things is also the head of the church. This Jesus who took on the likeness of humanity and served as a servant now reigns over all things. And the father has appointed him as the head of the church of God with such a leader. What therefore is the church to fear today? What could she require that cannot be provided for her as Christ is her head? Verse 19 asserts that those who do not hold fast to the head of the body from whom the entire body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. You see, Paul describes individuals who reject the authority and power of the head as being disloyal to the body. And because of this, the body tends towards disintegration. In other words, the only source of strength and unity for the body of Christ is its head. If the head is disregarded, there can be no nourishment. And as a result, the members of the body start to crumble and the body ceases to grow. My friend, in conclusion, it is evident that speaking truth and love is a crucial starting point for anyone aspiring to grow in Christ. You see, the body of Christ cannot function effectively without its head providing direction. Similar to how a human body cannot operate without its head. Belief in the existence of God is strengthened by visible evidence, and it is reasonable to assume that even more convincing evidence would be available if humans could perceive the invisible creations of the Lord. But regardless of one's position or level of authority in the church, both position and power are divinely delegated, and only those who submit to the bridegroom 
will attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is unnatural for a child to grow faster than its body. And it is unscriptural for the body of Christ not to grow faster 